Now we're going to talk about supply, long run aggregate supply. Well, in the long run, the price level has no impact on supply. So that's what the long run aggregate supply curve looks like. Long run aggregate supply. That's it. Move on. Well, I guess there's a little bit more. Uh, why doesn't the price level affect the long run aggregate supply curve? Well, because in the long run, supply is determined by the amount of labor, the amount of capital, that's both physical and human capital, natural resources, and technology. That's what determines supply over the long haul. So if the price level changes, well, that's not going to change output. Well, here's, here's why. Going back to our uh, example before, we have the real money supply. Say we had five divided by five equals one. When we had burgers, money supply in our pockets of five bucks and the price of a burger is five, our real wealth is one. Now let's suppose that uh, the money supply is doubled to 10. There it is. Our real wealth is now two. Now before, in the previous example, the price level fell to 250, and that gave us two. This time, price level staying the same at five, and we've increased the money supply. We've doubled the money supply. Now the question is, can you just can you increase real wealth by simply printing more money? In the long run, no, you cannot. Think of it. More money? Are there now suddenly more cows, more chickens? No. No, there's just more money. So what's going to happen? Well, th this isn't going to happen here. What's going to happen is this is going to be gradu gradually being bid up over time. until prices simply adjust. So in other words, there's going to be some inflation. Over the long haul, that's the adjustment that's going to be made. So again, money supply, price level, that's not going to have an impact. And bec that's because of something called monetary neutrality. Oh, sorry about that. Monetary neutrality, which we talked about earlier. We talked about monetary neutrality. That uh, what it says that nominal variables cannot affect uh, real variables in the long run. Okay. And as you might recall, uh, real variable is measured in physical units. This would be a real variable, the number of burgers. These are nominal variables, the money supply, prices. This is how many burgers we can buy. And by simply by changing this or this, isn't going to change this in the long run. So here we are, a perfectly inelastic, if you had micro, <laughs> okay, uh, insensitive 
to any changes in the price level. In other words, this is the amount of supply in the long run right there, that spot, regardless of what the price level is. Well, where this is planted is called the natural rate natural rate of output. Okay. Or natural rate of production. That's the output at which we have full employment. So in other words, in, in, in our little graph, uh, in this graph, we'd be on this line, okay? This is our potential GDP, and so it's, it's on this line. This is plotting GDP over time, and this here, this here is at a point in time, okay? Where it is, again, this is the natural rate of output, and that takes place at the uh, natural rate of unemployment. So whenever we're producing at the natural rate of output, we're also at the natural rate of unemployment, which is roughly, you know, ballpark 5%-ish. So one of the nice things about this uh, this graph, this aggregate supply and aggregate demand graph, is along this axis, as GDP grows, you know, we're moving along this way, but implied, implied there is that unemployment is going down as we're increasing GDP. As GDP is falling, implied is an increase in the unemployment rate. So we don't have unemployment along this uh, directly on this graph, but uh, we know how they're related and we know what's going on with unemployment as we move back and forth along here. Now this natural rate will change when any of the following determinants of production change. Uh, labor. Well, if we have more labor, say from immigration, that will shift that long run aggregate supply curve to the right. If we have more capital, uh, that, that's human and physical capital more knowledge and skills, more plant and machinery. That will, well, let me, more knowledge and skills, plant and machinery, that kind of thing. Uh, that's uh, plant and machinery, physical capital, knowledge and skills, uh, human capital. That will shift this long run aggregate supply curve to the right. More natural resources, or greater av availability. You might have all kinds of natural resources there, uh, but if the law says you can't go after them, you can't, uh, you know, harvest them. Well, it's as if they're not there. So greater availability, new new discoveries and or greater avail availability will shift that out again to the right. Long range aggregate supply shifts out to the right, meaning that our natural rate of output is increasing. Okay, we're moving along this line. Okay. Well, um, and technology. That's been a huge one over the years. Technology. 
Uh, we've seen computers revolutionize the economy. We've seen the internet, my goodness, revolutionize the economy. Information technology in general uh, shift this thing out big time. Now let's put this all together, what we've got so far. Here's the price level, GDP, long run aggregate supply, aggregate demand. Okay, here's our equilibrium, there's our price level, and We'll just, well, let's just put Q stars, our output. There's our level of GDP. Natural rate of GDP, where our unemployment rate is at the natural rate of unemployment. Okay. Now, let's say that there's new technology, some big new machine or a way of doing things. And let's say the stock market is booming. Well, the new technology will shift the aggregate supply curve to the right. And with the stock market booming, remember, that's going to consumers... Consumer spending is going to increase, and of course, consumer spending is a component of GDP, meaning aggregate demand, C plus I plus G plus NX. So we're going to have aggregate demand shifting. We have a new equilibrium. Price level increases, and we have an increase in GDP. This is what we would call inflationary growth. Just note that we have growth. Long-run aggregate supply is shifted to the right. We have an increase in GDP. But also notice we have an increase in the price level. And that is because aggregate demand shifted out further than aggregate supply. Now let's do another one. Okay, there's our um, price level, equilibrium price level, equilibrium output. Okay, so, well, let's suppose that uh, greater availability of natural resources. And expectations are very optimistic, and capital investment increases. So the increase in aggregate I, capital investment, is part of aggregate demand. So we would have a shift in the aggregate demand curve. And... In this case, let's say we have a huge increase in long-run aggregate supply. Actually, I should have had this as a, an example of uh, new technology, but we'll get to that in a second. 
an example from the 1990s. Well, anyway, this is, uh, we have uh, an expansion here, and uh, there's no inflation. Okay, so that's uh, pretty uh, simple. What do you think we call that? We call that growth without inflation. <laughs> okay, growth without inflation. And the key to that is, uh, is a big, big shift in aggregate, long run aggregate supply. So, that's how that works. We shift the curves, we see the new equilibrium. That part really isn't new. We've been shifting curves uh, throughout the semester. But now we've got this different model. We've got to remember what shifts long run aggregate supply. We have to remember what shifts aggregate demand and just take them one at a time. Now, let's talk about this thing that happened in the 1990s. Uh, back in the 1990s, and I'm getting a little ahead maybe with the monetary policy and so forth, but that's okay. Back in the 90s, we had uh, a lot of stuff going on. We had the stock market booming. It was booming like crazy. And we had aggregate demand shifting Big shifts in aggregate demand because of this booming stock market. But also, and, and right there, chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, Alan Greenspan, was under a lot of pressure to uh, tighten up the money supply because the worry was, well, what's the worry? If we just stop right here, we go from this point to this point, and we have what? an increase in the price level, we have inflation. So the worry was that because the stock market was booming like crazy and, uh, we, and the, we were, we were going to have inflation because the expectation was that the long-run aggregate supply curve couldn't keep up. So here's our equilibrium there. And we're, we're you know, even if it shifts clear out here, we still got inflation. Now, what was amazing about the 1990s was that the aggregate supply curve shifted way out here. And Alan Greenspan was convinced not to clamp down on the money supply to try to put on the brakes on the economy. Over and over said, come on, Alan, this is the new economy. Don't do it. This is the new economy. We, that, that's a term I haven't heard in 20 years because the last time we heard it, I think, was right around 2000, 2002. <laughs> um, the new economy meant back then technology. Because why did this curve shift so far out? Why did the long run aggregate supply curve make these huge, this huge shift that kept up with the ag huge aggregate demand because of the booming stock market? We had GDP growing like crazy. As you can see, this models it quite well. No inflation. We had this tremendous economic growth with no inflation. Well, And the reason was we had this amazing new technology called the Internet. In 1990, uh, almost no one had Internet. Okay, It was just barely even heard of, as I recall. By 2000, everybody had it. Everybody's using it. And, of course, by 2010, it was just... It just well, I mean, it, it, by, by 2000, it revolutionized everything. It had, it had brought the world pretty much close, in, into one market. It, it had a tremendous impact. The last time we had anything close to this was probably in the 1920s with electricity. In 1920, most homes didn't have it. By 1930, most homes did. And... Uh, it was, uh, 
I don't think we've had anything as revolutionary uh, as far as turning an economy on its head, as far as how things were done, and increasing production and productivity uh, as the Internet. Uh, so that was the belief. That was the new economy. That's what uh, they were talking about. And uh, Alan Greenspan was convinced he did not intentionally try to slow down the economy for fear of inflation by restricting the money supply. So it boomed along, boomed along, boomed along. And what part of that fueling the economy uh, was capital investment. Capital investment was another thing uh, fueling aggregate demand. Capital investment was increasing because there was this thing called Y2K. All the computers were programmed without any foresight of changing our century from the 1990s to the 2000s. And they were scared of this glitch that was going to happen and uh, that was going to shut down the system. Well, as soon as we cranked over to 2000, that we called that the Y2K. And uh, fortunately, nothing happened. But all the capital investment, all the preparation for that was fueling aggregate demand as well. And uh, once we crossed over 2000, it's like the brakes stopped. This, 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 uh, this stopped in its tracks. All that capital investment just came to a screeching halt. And we actually went into a recession <laughs> because it just, we, there's this boom, 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 boom. And uh, even though this new technology called the internet had revolutionized the entire uh, world economy, um, we never heard the words new economy again. I haven't heard it. Uh, that was a big word we heard about constantly in the late 90s. Haven't heard about it since. And the reason is, once, once you've revolutionized the economy, I mean, once it's been done, once these, these, we've got these huge shifts in long-range aggregate supply as a result, that only happens once. I mean, it doesn't, ca it doesn't keep going forever. I mean, once everything's switched over to the Internet, then we're back where we were. Now, maybe we can sustain higher growth without inflation than we used to. Uh, that's very possible. But it, we, the huge gains that we experienced, um, probably not. You can't count on those continuing on uh, forever. Well, so there's an application uh, of our long-run aggregate supply curve and our aggregate demand curve to a real-life situation in the 1990s why was the economy able to grow so fast without inflation? That's modeled perfectly here with these. Uh, what, what happened, the reason it could, is because we had these big shifts in long-run aggregate supply. That's what, that's what did it. Otherwise, growth level that fast would have been inflationary during normal times but it wasn't during the 90s because of this new technology, this new thing, this new internet that we're enjoying right this minute, right? We'd have to shut down. Without the internet, if this uh, COVID-19 thing happened uh, before the internet days, we'd be shut down right now. So it's been a tremendous asset to us. So. Uh, Anyway, long run aggregate supply in the books. We'll come back uh, with a short run aggregate supply, and that's what we use to model those fluctuations. And I'm sorry to say, it's a little bit involved. It's a it's a it's a tricky one. There's a lot going on there with the short run aggregate supply. <laughs>